Hello everyone. It's a pleasure to be in Barcelona. I will uh, step down. Uh, I'm not that very uh, tall, so if uh, I hope you can see me, but it's uh, going straight into my eyes and I really want to see you. So uh, yeah, do ask questions uh, and uh, throw tomatoes, whatever works for you to get my, um, uh, to uh, get uh, um, uh, my attention, because uh, it's, a, it's a very uh, interesting topic, very hope for some discussions. Uh, so we're going to the talk about refactoring uh, organizations for Flow. Mind you, I should start. Who is uh, a football uh, fan, of especially Barcelona? Okay, so I really wish Robert will show what he's capable of. I'm really sorry. So uh, I should start with that. Uh, OK, good stuff. Uh, my assumption is if you're here, yeah, exactly. If you're here today, uh, you know what? I'm going to refactor my stand. Better. So my assumption is that if you're here today, you're working on products. Raise your hand if you're building a product. My, my, exactly. Great stuff. Really happy for you to be here, here today. So when you build a product, um, the very, there are very important questions that you need to ask yourself. The most important question is, of course, can you do it better? Can you do it faster? Can you do uh, more optimizations, et cetera, et cetera? They will sell you a lot of stuff, mumbo jumbo, uh, very often. Uh, I won't use some words, but actually I want to talk to you about some real engineering tools, practices and uh, uh, concepts that really work and they were, they were really proven so you can try them yourself and talk to, to, talk to some people who, who did. Happy to share my experience. Uh, so why are we even discussing that? Because um, when you want to build a product, uh, of course you need to work in the team. And what are, what are the best teams? What, do, uh, what are the characteristics? Well, the first one is the ownership. So, of course, uh, the best teams own their work. So, you may recall this from the DevOps practices. So, the, the best teams are really owning what they build. They really own their roadmap as well. So, they're responsible for what they work and, uh, and the business outcome. The second that we really love as engineers is autonomy, don't we? We hate people to tell us what to do and how to do it, uh, but uh, we also need to be, uh, be um, uh, from my perspective, it's great when we are, uh, gain the autonomy to build the right product. Now the question will be, how should we build the right product? And we'll answer that in a moment. The third one that I uh, really recommend is mastership. So it also comes from, of course, the DevOps practices, but you really want to do the best. We want to grow. That's why you're also here. And that's why you uh, you continue learning, and uh, 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 from my perspective, you uh, also want to work with the best teams and the uh, and the best uh, people to build the most interesting products, right? And there is a certain law, uh, which is like a law of physics, like gravity, that will fall on your head if you ignore it. Who knows the uh, Mel Conway and his. Uh, uh, famous Conway's law. Okay, so that's really interesting because usually I know uh, it's like half of the, the half the room raises the hand. So I should maybe elaborate a little bit. There was a uh, the, he's an engineer, a uh, software engineer, by the way. Uh, in the '67, he wrote a very interesting paper. I think it was '67, 1967, by the way. Uh, on organizations and uh, how do they communicate for optimal um, setup to design the right product and design the right solution. So really interesting, so this is what we do, right? We communicate in order to design and implement our products. And 60 years ago, uh, nearly 60 years ago, he did a, uh, a thorough research and came out with the, this, what is called the Conway's Law. So organizations which design system are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structure of these organizations. In other words, whatever you build will be built in the way you communicate. Think about that. How whatever is the uh, uh, setup of your teams, 
the, uh, they will and how they communicate, how they interact, will be reflected in your product. So if you have, uh, uh, think it about this for another minute, so let's say you've got three different teams. If you're working in silos, what will be the result? Siloed products. And uh, you will be surprised, why are we not knowing anything about the changes that we're going to uh, deploy, right? So you need to uh, take, um, and this is uh, of course, um, uh, law, we take it as for granted, that's why, why I want to spend a little bit uh, time on it. Uh, so it's really important not to ignore it. And uh, just very quickly, you will find me on uh, LinkedIn and Twitter, not on Facebook, uh, sorry. Um, and I'm head of engineering and uh, engineering executive for Revolut, so uh, really happy to talk to you. I'm also quite fresh because it's my seventh month, end of the seventh month in Revolut, so I have still uh, some really fresh memories. Okay, let's kick this off. So thesis for the evening that I'm going, hopefully, to convince you to. You can design your teams and their interaction, therefore the systems that they will produce, the same way we design our code and our systems. So, and I'm going to t tell you about the tools that we can use. Okay, we need to start with product strategy. Now the problem is, that's boring, right? Uh, usually you want to go and code as quickly as possible. No, not really. Because you need to answer, answer yourself. What are you coding and why are you coding it? So uh, we know that nine in 10 startups fail and uh, they produce some excellent code. Probably the coverage is excellent and CICD is fully set up. All of the tools are perfect and we use the full cloud uh, solution. So we're cloud, uh, cloud a native application, but we still fail. And the question is why? And uh, uh, this, I believe this is our responsibility as software engineers, as product engineers, to actually understand this really well and also to con contribute. Okay, first tool that I would like you to, to be convinced to is Lean Canvas. Try to use it, it's very, very simple. And I will tell you why. Because as an engineer, I'm really interested in the problem that I'm going to solve. So the first part of the Lean Canvas. I, uh, I love to work with, uh, uh, with the business stakeholders that I work with to understand, okay, what is exactly the, the, the problem? Now, if you're thrown with the long presentation of 100 pages, that means that probably your business doesn't understand the problem. The, as you can see, the Lean Canvas is really constrained. It's A4 size. So you need to write your problem very, very specifically. It's a perfectly um, extracted problem. Uh, it's uh, very interesting. Uh, uh, you can also look at existing alternatives. So you, as we as engineers, we can uh, understand, okay, what are the other uh, alternatives that we can look into? That's so it's quite often very important for us, right? Second is customer segments. In other words, who are we solving our problem for? That's very important when you ask yourself a question. Maybe these users will need some extra guidance. Maybe they're not really technical. Maybe, etc., etc. These are all the questions you can answer uh, when you ask the right question. Third is, what is unique value proposition? So what are you focusing on? And I will come back to this because this is probably one of the most important questions that I get answers to when I uh, do this exercise. Fourth is the solution that you uh, discuss with the business stakeholder. And very important, which I'll come back to, is the fifth one. So unfair advantage. In other words, why are we really better than any other company that is doing pretty much the same? So uh, uh, very interesting uh, answers. Okay. <coughs> so to summarize, if you want to take some pictures, these are the questions that I love to ask uh, my business stakeholders. And I should go down. There is a link uh, uh, where you can read a little bit more about, uh, uh, about the tool. So I really recommend, if you don't know it, if you haven't used it. Maybe uh, let's, uh, uh, to, for me to understand, who used Link Canvas before or seen the Link Canvas before? Great, I'm really happy for you. <laughs> yeah, so the benefits, just to summarize the tool. Shared understanding agreement, how rare this is, by the way, that we have an agreement with the business st stakeholders. We were focused on the right things, as you can see. It's not a sales pitch for 30 pages or 30 slides. 
these are really the three, four sentences per box, maximum. And we can therefore understand the right metrics. So how do we measure our success? Now, the second tool that I really recommend, worldly maps. Who used or seen anything like this? Okay, I do recommend Googling after our uh, our, our uh, meeting. Meeting. It's uh, when they were introduced. It was really hard to understand what they are. So I'm going to walk you through like one on one and very quickly tell you how you can uh, really get the best of it. So you start off the uh, the top with the user, and the user have some needs. So I made a very quick uh, uh, worldly maps uh, uh, exercise for you. So as a traveler traveling to Barcelona yesterday, I needed uh, to book some experience. Hopefully uh, this is the, the thing and it will end somewhere in the night. I needed to get my insurance just in case my experience is just uh, a little bit too in intensive. And I needed to exchange money because unfortunately I'm not using Euro every day. Uh, for every um, uh, need of, of me, as the user, there is an, uh, each of these needs needs something to give me that. So that's the second level. So for instance, booking an experience requires ex uh, experience recommendation and experience aggregation. So we need to aggregate all of the experiences and recommend me RevDev. So uh, uh, that's uh, for the, the plan. There you go forward. For each of them, what do they need to provide that need to the user? And there are a couple of services that I could use. Um, when, you, uh, when you're finished and uh, discussing with the business, what you, uh, so, uh, what you can do is put um, uh, actually two axes uh, uh, which are quite important. So first one is the value chain. So we did it as you could see from how this is visible to the user to the least visible to the user. And the second axis is um, what's the innovation of uh, evolution uh, status? So how innovative versus uh, stable the community it is? Uh, very interesting results. And uh, there are a couple of things that are, uh, are really great with this because that triggers the right conversation with the business. As you could see, I only focus on the user and on the needs. And then what are those needs satisfied by from the perspective of the function, product functionalities and what these product functionalities need uh, in order to satisfy that user. Very concrete conversation with the business. No place for uh, uh, lack of uh, clarity and, uh, and mumbo jumbo. So I really, really love that tool. Uh, there is a link, again, learn worldly mapping. So uh, if you want to take a picture, definitely go for it. Now, we know the strategy, so I've shown you two very simple tools that will give you answer why are we even trying to build this and who, uh, who for and uh, what it will be the value. Now, we, when you have the idea, you need to cut this uh, into pieces, right? Decom decompose your problem and uh, uh, try to produce it and make sure that you start building it. What are the tools for it? Well, of course, I will discuss a number of tools from the domain driven design. So, hands up if you if you know, let's say, uh, at least what is strategic and uh, tactical DDD, and uh, maybe use some of the patterns, tools, or practices, like event storming, for instance. Okay, good stuff. So, domain driven design, uh, in one word, is a when you uh, when you hear the team that is telling you that they use domain driven design they i wouldn't believe them it's like it's like it's not binary zero one domain driven design is a set of tools and practices uh that you can it's like a toolbox you can take any of them none of them i actually uh, uh use uh, some of them not even naming them uh, exactly how we uh, name them in uh, ddd it's a uh, really useful knowledge, so I encourage you to do so. In domain-driven design, uh, by the way, it's like twi 20 years of engineering, very solid engineering, a lot of books. One of the brightest engineering minds of, uh, 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 that we know work on, on some of these concepts. So this is really solid knowledge. This is pure engineering. Um, so domain-driven design has this concept that we have three domains, uh, three types of domains, sorry. So if every, by domain we understand, okay, so l let's say 
But when I shown you the Revolut, I shown you the stays, the experiences, the insurance. These are different sub uh, categories of the problems. And these are, in the fact, different business domains. Therefore, different processes included uh, to support them, to give, give them uh, as a function to the user. And domain-driven design tells you, when you are a company like Revolut, there will be a core domain. And remember this unfair advantage from the Lean Canvas that I've shown you. Or you, uh, or you can look at the worldly maps and think, OK, what really makes me so different as Revolut as any other startup why people are really paying for my services, why am I making money that really stands out? And when you ask these questions as, as the engineer, as for instance, as a consultant, every company will tell you, oh, our problem is unique. And I will tell you, most of the problems that we have are not unique, but there is a certain group of problems and sub in the, uh, 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 these domains that are, uh, uh, that are unique to your business. And this is really important to identify them. Why? Well, I'll show you in a moment. Supporting. So anything that gives you uh, 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 the ability to pr produce these really important revenue driving domains. And generic. So this is something that uh, is a complex problem, has been solved, but it really doesn't give you any, an, uh, any business advantage. So if you look, look at these tools, you will understand them. These are some uh, very often complex problems like invoicing. If you're not an invoicing company, invoicing is super complex uh, problem, right? Especially if you're like Revolut, uh, trying to do it in 30 whatever countries, 32 I think. Now, how to identify them? I recommend the tool and you can take the picture event storming. So I'm not going to uh, talk much about this. This is a really good tool for brainstorming. You uh, talk to the business, you identify the whole process, the whole flow, uh, uh, and you start to uh, uh, understand each of these groups is a different uh, domain that uh, you have in the business. So that might be booking, that might be um, uh, experience, that might be insurance, and so on and so forth. And uh, the uh, uh, orange uh, cards, uh, sorry, the orange cards are the events. So what's happening in your system? So we understand really, really well what's in the system and uh, and why. And I said, well, what you can do is you can identify with the business. Okay, so what's core? What's driving our revenue? Like really, what's making uh, uh, the, uh, the, the our bank account uh, to get money? And what's the generic? We'll come back to that because you can put them on the map. And there is a, a beautiful uh, usage of that. So there is a, a one axis is business logic complexity. So you ask yourself as an engineer, how complex is, th is this process? So for instance, experiences, how complex is this? Insurance, how complex it is? Like really, what's the process? What's the complexity of the process? And the second is business differentiation. So that means how much it makes you different from your competition. Go back to we can go back to the lean canvas and check. Okay, who is our competition? How how, how much does it make us to stand out, and uh, how much does it make us to to be different? If you do that, you will see different domains being placed in different places. Uh, yeah, and what you can have is a first a refactoring. You can think, okay. Are the domains that actually we can make uh, work for us, that uh, we can uh, uh, actually make them make money for us, uh, and uh, we can make them maybe more complex. Therefore, it will be harder for our competitors to copy it and actually to make, uh, get us out of the business. And the vice versa. We can ask the question, can we simplify some of these domains? Because we don't need to uh, work on everything, right? We don't have to build everything ourselves. We can simplify some of this stuff. Okay, the question to you, how teams and uh, their responsibilities grow over time when we uh, go to teams set up and their interactions? So a question, open a question to the room and please uh, uh, think of that. So when you start the, uh, uh, when you start the company, when you start the team, uh, your, your team will gain more and more responsibilities. I from your experience, how does it grow? 
maybe it doesn't, but usually teams are getting more and more responsibilities. So how does it happen? Any ideas? New features, fr uh, from uh, where are they coming from? From, uh, I'm sorry? F the needs from the business, yeah. I would say yes and. Very often our, I'm really sorry, but our product owners wanting to get a promotion sometimes and saying, yeah, we can do it, by the way, by two weeks time or whatever. Sometimes it happens. I was in this place. <laughs> so um, uh, sometimes uh, it uh, unfortunately grows like that. Does it have to grow like that? Uh, so uh, does it have to be like that? From my perspective, not. <laughs> Look what we've done. So on our map, we have our domains. So usually uh, each domain will be uh, uh, a set of features built by one team, like I mentioned, experiences, insurance, booking, etc., etc. What uh, we can do now is put the number of people working for each of these domains. Look what happens. I can now understand how many people from the team that I have are really working on the stuff that makes our better business. Better meaning more successful. Usually, most of the people will be working on the stuff that is not uh, relevant to the success of our uh, business, for, uh, of our operations. And therefore, uh, we can start the right the discussions. By the way, we're still using only engineering tools and only engineering practices. So uh, we can start to ask these questions. Um, so uh, the, uh, the next thing that I do is st I start to look at the talent density. So what are, uh, what is the experience? Not only from the technical perspective, like senior, junior, et cetera, et cetera, but what is the experience with the domain? So how strong are these people now understanding the whole business? And uh, 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 for that, actually, you can use also engineering tools, analyze the code. So you can analyze the code looking into each of these domains and see, okay, how are these people contributing? And what are they contributing to? So one thing is what you learn from the business and from the product owners. The second thing is what you will see in the code, because the truth is in the code, right? So what I encourage you to do is then look into the, the, these domains and what are you in really investing in, right? So you pay these people X amount of money and the question is where this money goes to. And as we said, uh, you can uh, make these meaningful decisions. And a couple of heuristics that I, uh, that I would recommend is you want your best engineers to work on your core domain. Very often they work on generic domains, they work on gener uh, like these supportive domains, which, uh, which we can, by the way, usually simplify. Because in most cases, by the way, as an ex-engineer, still engineer, hopefully, uh, if uh, 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 like 15 years ago you would come to me, I would always say, yeah, let's do this. And uh, it's like hype-driven development, you know that, uh, what, uh, what I can use? Well, anything. Just give me the problem that I can build, right? And a lot of engineers think like that. I'm guilty as charged, by the way. I'm really sorry to my previous teams. But what you, if you ask the right questions, in supportive domain, most of the problems that we have are really simple. And we can simplify the decisions. So I'm starting to make architectural decisions about the, uh, some of the problems. So I can really simplify the, the work there. Usually, when I ask the right questions, these are, in most cases, simple data collection, data analysis, and display forms. Nothing else. There is simply, very often, no logic. But you need to ask the right question and generalize the problem. You need to also understand that some of the problems are really similar. So when your business tells you, oh, our problem is unique, challenge them. Believe me, that really pays. And by the way, this is a really good also part of the problem which, uh, uh, which you can uh, ask new joiners to start with and learn about your product. And generic, I mentioned invoicing. How many companies build their own invoicing module? Or think of anything that you build but really doesn't support your success. For, for this, I would say just stop it or outsource it. And uh, you, can, uh, you don't have to be worried that your business secrets will leak with these domains because uh, uh, these are really uh, generic problems. So uh, there's a couple of heuristics. I'm sorry, if you want to take a, uh, a picture, have it. 
Let me know when you're done, okay? Uh, <laughs> and we can make, make these informed decisions. So we can start to think about the right architecture, the right team setup, and we can have meaningful dis discussions with the teams. For instance, what are the design patterns that uh, we, we can use, right? Because as we spoke, uh, for instance, for core, you need some very evolutionary, uh, very interesting practices, and people who understand this code will change pretty much every single day. Okay, very quickly, uh, so I speed up. You can design your teams also, and I do recommend this book, uh, by looking at what kind of teams have you got. So first uh, one, by according to the authors, is stream-aligned teams. So these are the teams that are working according to the stream of let's say features and requests and they keep coming so these are your uh, product uh, teams enabling teams are the ones that are helping these teams to get better usually this will be your best practices uh, guardians so very interesting concept we uh, we actually use that in revolut complicated subsystems teams so you can actually look at some of the uh, some of the problems that you have and there will be some complex tools that you've built for whatever reason in uh, of course in revolut you can guess there are plenty of those and you can actually um, uh, have some good practices for these teams to work and platform teams and the platform is uh, understood as tools for developers to do their work so if you want to uh, 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 take a picture once again please do uh, have it and uh, this book will give you the full set of practices and good standards for highly optimal engineering teams now what we can de design also is in the interaction of these teams so first is collaboration so two teams collaborating very very closely they usually uh, discuss their uh, changes they need to sync their changes etc cetera, etc cetera. so what are the practices well you guess these are the practices for the teams that they need to collaborate very easily. By the way, I do recommend, if you haven't tried, for the teams to have contracts, like official contracts. And they can sit down together, like for instance senior engineers in the teams, and agree how should we collaborate, how often should we discuss changes, you know, etc., etc. Do we review our uh, plans for changes? Uh, so this is uh, where teams will be collaborating very closely. X as a service is another pattern that is described, and this is very often you, uh, seen, for instance, as uh, when teams um, expose their APIs and they work on their APIs. Like, for instance, as you know, Google and uh, AWS is known for exposing teams exposing their APIs. Product uh, API is a product, and they're responsible for their APIs. Uh, the third one is facilitating. So one team uh, is basically been working very closely with another one and uh, um, uh, and help them, mentor them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And to give you, a, uh, there, there, there are. Uh, by the way, what you can do is put this on the map. And this is Revolut Business, by the way. So you can actually build such a map, and you can design the, the collaboration between teams. Then you can discuss with them. Why are you proposing some of the uh, uh, some of the changes? Why are you proposing some of the optimizations? And you have a full guideline guide guidebook, sorry, of the good practices. So uh, you can definitely do that. Uh, yep. So if you want to take a picture, uh, so that's what you can do. Very very quickly. So my recommendation is shift talent between teams. Understand where you have uh, uh, where you have the revenue streams. What is important for your users? Shift the responsibilities for subdomains between teams. Don't let them grow because somebody wants the promotion or uh, somebody didn't want to do something. M uh, let uh, make people discuss what you're what you're building and why. Then uh, try to outsource some of the stuff that you don't need to build. Just get it out. You have some extra engineers for free that uh, can work on your problems. Simplify uh, architecture where feasible. And of course, make sure that it's uh, the right uh, type of architecture where, where needed. Optimize your in integration and communication patterns. This is important, as we discussed. So contracts recommended. And simulate how your future roadmap. By the way, you've seen a lot of maps. So we can simulate different decisions and how it will affect different teams all of the engineering tools. 
So coming back to the Conway's law, now we understand why you, why we discussed it. Uh, and I would say design your teams for the high flow because you can do it with a set of tools. By the way, this is a toolbox. You don't need to use all of that. You can use some of that and see if it works for you. So I do recommend you to, uh, to try uh, uh, the tools that you like the most. So this is like a mon mental model. Yeah, it's visible. Mental model, what, what we were trying to build here. Uh, so uh, uh, next slide is the one that you want to take a picture of because I selected the best books for you. Uh, that you can use to uh, to get the deeper into the topic. So all of them are really, really good. Uh, and uh, uh, some of them are actually excellent. So if you want to learn uh, domain-driven design and get smoothly into the topic, uh, thanks to especially Vladik Konon over the, the bottom, there is a book, Learning DD. Yeah, that's, that's the one here. Uh, it's really well written and uh, it gets you smoothly into the, uh, the domain of and design and you will understand more about what we discussed today. Really recommended books by Marty Kagan, Inspired and Empowered. If you haven't read, I definitely recommend that. So, what we didn't have time to talk about. I assume we have leadership basics. So, uh, the, and the DevOps practices, so, so that was my assumption. There is a very powerful tool called, uh, called Context Map. There were some, uh, uh, when, uh, when you remember, there was this diagram where we were putting um, domains on the, on the map, on the, uh, 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 this axis, the business differentiation and complexity. There are known patterns that you can use to actually improve your product and improve your uh, uh, setup. And world, world the maps are just briefly touched on. There is a hall of knowledge, how to talk with the business and how to make uh, meaningful strategy decisions. So, did anyone read Conway's paper? Really good, I do recommend it. It's a brilliant work and it's 55 years old. Wow, it's even older than me. Uh, at the uh, very bottom of the, of the paper, because most of the people will, uh, uh, when you say Conway's law, will, they will know the, the, the sentence that I shown you. At the very bottom of the Conway's paper is this gem hidden. 55 years ago, we already knew that in order to design really good quality products and systems, we need to uh, find the tools and leadership methods to constantly relearn and adapt. This is 55 years ago. Shame on us for ignoring it for so long, I would say. And thank you. By the way, I haven't used the word agile at all during this presentation, so thank you. <laughs> yes, of course, I forgot questions. <laughs> In the meantime, I can show some interesting numbers about Revolut. Uh, I will change because I've got a couple of slides. Uh, so yeah, questions. Hello, and thank you for the talk. Uh, this was uh, really enlightening. I have a question, and actually maybe a couple of questions. So first, my first question is, how many of these tools uh, have been used before you joined Revolut? Because you said you've joined seven months ago. Uh, definitely some of them. I don't know all of them. Uh, I don't know all of the teams. I mean, Revolut is really, really big and really spread it all over the world. Uh, but uh, I know we used uh, definitely some of the tools that I mentioned. Yeah. Okay. So we should expect new products faster. Yeah, uh, <laughs> sooner. Definitely, definitely we can do it. Yeah. Okay. The, the, but by the way, the pace at Revolut is amazing. So just to clarify. Okay. Uh, well noted. Yeah. Uh, and my second question is that whole process of the refactoring of your organization would assume that engineering is having a driving role in the process because in a lot of organizations like we are, I'm in enterprise and engineering is a supplementary function and the business is driven by sales, marketing, everyone except engineering. Would you say that unless that changes, implementing that strategy is not possible? Very good question. So. 
I would encourage everyone, at least one in their lives, to try to build a startup as an engineer or to be co-founder. It's a life uh, lesson. Uh, so I build my own company as well. Um, I would say it's a, it is a little bit of a question, what is our role as a, as a software engineer? And I would say software engineering is not about writing code. That's the very last bit of the whole mental process that needs to go into understanding the problem that, we're, uh, that we need to uh, build and to make sure that we actually use our skills in the best uh, uh, business, uh, for best for the business, best for the users. Therefore, I really like the concept that we need to be, become product engineers. There is an excellent blog post by Jerry Orosh, by the way, product engineering. If you Google it, you will find it. And it covers uh, really well what uh, should be the, pro the responsibilities of software engineers. If we think about that, uh, if we think about that, I would say uh, we should be consultants of our own business and we should have toolboxes, uh, uh, a big tool toolbox of different techniques, tools and practices to make sure that uh, our business succeed. Our business is really good at what it is, right? Selling, marketing, uh, supporting. We're product builders, so we build the value. So I would say definitely, definitely uh, I recommend uh, for us to become our own company consultants. All right, thank you. Thank you. Hello, um, thank you so much for the presentation. It was really informative and um, helpful. helpful. Um, so my question is like at the end of the presentation, you said like I haven't, I haven't said an agile uh, word. <laughs> and my question is why? Um, yeah, the c coming out. Um, uh, there is a problem with Agile that uh, I had probably for the last uh, years, and don't get me wrong, it's um, uh, Agile really shaped a lot of what we do and how we worked. Uh, but I think it was taken to to a consulting extreme, and a lot of there is a lot of stuff that is um, in a lot of techniques, uh, frameworks, methodologies are forgotten, and that's is product engineering. And I would say you don't need to use, uh, you know, you can pick from these frameworks whatever works for you, as long as you do the right thing in the right way. So do you need exactly this number of meetings with that s time box, et cetera, et cetera, in order to build the right product? I would, uh, I would uh, actually uh, say no. You whatever works for you. If, uh, if you can, there are a lot of great products that are built like fully async. There is no daily standups. There is no demos. And we use them every day. Like most of the open, so uh, so, uh, open source software is built as exactly like that. But you need to do, a, a, you need to understand why are you building it and how to build it. So that's why I really encourage to use engineering tools and practices to, in order to, uh, to construct our responsibilities as product teams. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you so much. Any other t uh, questions? Okay, I can see. Hello, and thank you for the presentation. Uh, you've been talking a lot about different tools to deal with teams. Uh, which one would you recommend for sharing presentations instead of making pictures? Um, can you elaborate on the question? Can you tell me something more? Yeah, sorry, I don't want to be rude or anything, but you've been asking us to take pictures of a screen which it really doesn't, I'm unable to read the titles of the books that you recommended. Okay, yeah, so uh, good, uh, good stuff. Uh, let me share the presentation with you somehow, and I will, uh, uh, maybe through the uh, you know, Java user group we can share that presentation, so happy to sh share it. I appreciate it, thank <laughs> you very much. As simple as that. Yeah, I'm really sorry. Yeah, I didn't think about uh, about the fact that uh, it might not be visible. Thank Practical you. Practical one. Uh, we have one question uh, online, okay. so maybe I will read it. Um, so Doji asks, I have a question about what would be the best to implement this and survive along with top-down task? 
like business needs and so on. Gradually. <laughs> I would uh, I would encourage uh, so let's say you don't use any of that you haven't used any of these first of all you need to learn these tools so ideally uh, look for meetups look for trainings that you can be online master some of these tools like event storming for instance and there is there is a lot of going on in the DD community and there is a massive uh, amount of material uh, that you can learn from so definitely first of all learn it second run the workshop uh, workshops with your team i recommend do not work or in on your own domain so you don't uh, uh, focus on your work problems work on some whatever domain you may think of like kickstarter or whatever uh, you may think of so that you learn the tool and you master it then try to implement whatever you like with the business and gain their trust the more you trust you get the more will be asked for, as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as we discuss as a consultant. So I would recommend first master some of these tools, play with them, um, and then make sure that you um, uh, that you gradually uh, introduce them. I know we have a question here in the front as well. Okay, so maybe let let it be the last one. Okay, unless someone have a very important one. When is the last one? Where? Okay. Hello. Thank you very much for the presentation. I think you already answered it when you talked about building trust and the way you think you can build trust between developers and business, because that was the question, like how do you build trust between development teams and business? Because you can bring them together, but, but if you have silhouette teams before, there will probably be some, I don't know, some suspicion between teams like, Business teams don't think the developers work very hard or don't don't uh, can handle pressure, and developers think the business people are mean and want to ship everything like yesterday. So, how to build this trust? Um, so I think yeah, I think we uh, uh, hopefully we answered some of that. But I would also add when you asked that, um, don't be harsh on you, and don't expect to fully succeed in the first go. And it's it's okay to, uh, to gradually get it to the uh, to the pace. These are, and a lot of tools that I shown you are really known in the community. They're really known for years, so they have also strong communities to support you. And uh, definitely, just go and join Slack, Discord, or whatever there is uh, for these communities. And as the questions, talk about your uh, problems, and there will be a lot of people who will gladly help as well. But uh, I should ask. Don't be really harsh on yourself if you fail first time. Really, really thank you that uh, you came here and you didn't fall asleep. <laughs>